Lab. Come on down. Come on down. Okay, it has been good to get to know these guys. Uh, we've been studying the Bible for a little bit. Uh, actually, Reggie and I have been studying with Tim, uh, Ariel, and uh, uh, June have been studying with Deb. And I want to give these to you guys. Uh, they have decided to join our church. I want to give you a hug, especially Tim. By the way, this guy loves it when you give him big hugs like this. Just so you know. All right. Uh, you guys can sit down. Give them a hand. Uh, we're really glad you guys have decided to join our church. Um, we study the Bible with everybody. Uh, Tim and Deb actually came over from another church, uh, but we, uh, we've enjoyed getting to know them through uh, those Bible studies. The reason we study the Bible with everybody uh, is it gives us a chance to build relationships and friendships with people. It also uh, helps us meet people's needs because all of us come from different backgrounds. We've got uh, different hurts. We've got different stories. We've got different things we've learned over the years. And so it kind of helps us all get on the same page here. Um, and we're just really excited to have, uh, have you guys and your family with us here. Uh, we're continuing our series here uh, entitled Less is More, which you might see some banners on the stage up here. This is actually our theme for the year. We started out the year talking about less is more. We take that from uh, the words of John the Baptist who said that I must become less, he must become more, talking about Jesus Christ. And the truth is, the more we can let Jesus take over our lives the more we can be less and let him be more in terms of how we make decisions, in terms of how we think, in terms of how we treat people, in terms of how we view authority, how we view the government, how we view voting, how we view our neighbor, how we view love, how we view everything, our lives are going to be better. Because Jesus lived a perfect life. And when I say Jesus lived a perfect life, I mean, you cannot one-up him. There's not one thing we could go back and and switch roles with him and do better than what he did. And if we will learn as human beings to be like him, he is the prototype for what it is to be a, a godly man, to be a godly woman, to be a godly father, a godly husband, a godly friend. And if we can be like him, we are gonna have the best lives that we can have. Now, that doesn't mean a life without hardship, because what happened in his life? Did Jesus face hardship in his life? Absolutely, he did. But he shows us, even as one who faced great hardship, how to do that faithfully, how to be a godly person in the midst of rough situations. And you might notice a theme. Some of us in here might feel pretty insignificant this morning. Okay, Uh, You might notice a theme, though, if you look in the Bible... God takes seemingly insignificant people throughout the scripture and does some amazing things with them. In fact, it's the people who think that they're a big deal, or maybe a lot of times who the world thinks is a big deal. They're kind of a footnote in the story of the Bible. Sometimes they're, you know, you're just kind of forgotten. It's these people that are seemingly insignificant that are these giant heroes of the faith. One of the things that's common between all of them, though, I I said heroes of the faith. Well, that word faith, that is what is common between all of these people that are significant in the scripture. What is common between them is they all put their faith in God. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. They put their faith in God. Some of you in here, when I say the word faith, you you think, oh, they belief, right? It's the same, same concept, mental assent. Uh, is where a lot of our minds go when we think about faith. We think about mentally believing that God is there, mentally believing that Jesus uh, died on the cross for my sins. That is part of it, okay? In In the word faith in the Bible, faith means four things. It does mean belief. It means mentally believing that God is there, but it also means in the original language and in the original thought, uh, loyalty, it means trust, and it means obedience, Those four things taken together are biblical faith, belief, trust, loyalty, and obedience. If you remove any one of those elements, you cease to have biblical faith. So just know that as we're going into this and we're talking about faith this morning. Uh, In Corinth as a church, if you want to look up a church that's really messed up in the Bible, like in in the New Testament, 
Corinth is a church that was really messed up. They had a lot of bad problems in Corinth. Uh, You've got some notes in your bulletin. If you want to pull those out, it's going to have some scriptures on there that we're going to look at. The first one is actually part of Paul's letter to this church in Corinth. It's 2 Corinthians 1. Uh, Paul writes, we felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. Now, he's writing to some people saying, there was a period of my life, there was a situation that I was dealing with, there there were some circumstances I was dealing with that just looked hopeless. And, and, and it caused me to hit rock bottom. It caused me to, 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 to just look in the face of this and like, how is this going to get worked out? He says, but that was actually a good thing because what did it cause him to do? It caused him to put his faith in God. And guys, some of you in here may be facing something bad this morning. You may be facing a situation that looks hopeless. And if it's not today, guys, it will be. You're going to face a situation at some point in your life that just looks hopeless. It looks like you can't overcome this problem. I don't know if it's a problem in your marriage. I don't know if it's a problem with one of your kids. I don't know if it's a problem with your health. I don't know if it's a struggle with addiction. I don't know what it might be. But at some point, if it's not today, you're going to face it. And the thing is, when you hit rock bottom, when you're facing a situation that looks hopeless, it can actually be a good thing because that hopeless situation can make you throw up your hands and say, I don't have the strength, I'm not enough, only God can help me with this. And what Paul is saying right here is, hey, that's a good place to be. Amen? How many of you have been there? I know I have. I know I have. And God works through that as long as we choose to put our faith in him. In fact, in 1 John, it says this is how you get victory in life. It says every child of God is able to defeat the world. And we win the victory over the world by means of what? Faith. We win the victory over the world by means of faith. That's belief, that's trust, that's loyalty, and that's obedience to God. That's how you get victory in life. And the thing is, that's a choice. And that's what we're going to see in this lesson over and over. This is a choice. Whether we put our faith in him or put our faith in ourselves, it's a choice. And I want to start us off getting our heads right this morning because one of the greatest acts that that we can look at and say there's a reason that I should put my faith in God is what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, in the scriptures it teaches that, that all of us are sinners. And when I say sinner, I don't just mean this generic, oh, I'm a sinner. No, no. When the Bible says you're a sinner, you guys realize what that means, right? It means you're cut off from God. It means your only destiny is destruction. It means when you die, there's no paradise for you or me, as long as I'm in my sin, right? I'm I'm cut off from God. I'm cut off from the source of good. I'm cut off from the source of light. I have no, no hope If I'm a sinner, right? That's what it means to be a sinner. It's not something we just toss around. Like, oh, I'm a sinner. No, that's a bad thing, right? There's no hope as long as I'm a sinner. Jesus says, I'm a sinner. The Bible says, I'm a sinner. God says, I'm a sinner. But God also says, I'm going to wake a way for you out of that. I'm going to make myself a human being, and I'm going to come into the world, and I'm going to die on a cross for your sins, I'm going to take all of that garbage onto myself that that is really you deserve because you're a sinner. I'm going to take that onto me. I'm going to take your punishment onto me. And then if you'll follow me, if you'll put your faith in me, if you'll give me your belief, your loyalty, your trust, and your obedience, I'm going to give all of my righteousness to you. I lived the perfect sinless life, but I'm going to give that to you like you did it. I'm going to take your penalty, I'm going to give you my blessing. I'm going to take your death, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to take your unrighteousness, I'm going to give you my righteousness. And and, and we're going to call it a day. And then I'm going to let you come in and be with me in eternity. That's the message of the Bible. Jesus says, I'm the king, I'm going to make everything right. And if you're on team Jesus, you're going to be part of the everything is right crowd. That sounds like a good crowd to be a part of, doesn't it? Okay? The reason you and I have faith in Jesus is because what we've seen Jesus do. The cross 
is something that we celebrate every week here at the crossings. It's something that Jesus asked to be celebrated. When he was still walking the earth, he got his friends together for a supper, and he said, hey, I want you to take this bread. It represents my body that's been broken. I want you to take some and remember me. I want you to take this cup that, that has this, this juice in it. I want you to drink it, and that's my blood that's going to be spilled for you. I want you to take it and remember me. This didn't make sense to them at the time because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. But shortly after that, he's arrested, he's falsely tried, he's crucified. He's resurrected three days later. He comes back and he explains this again to him. You remember when we took that supper? Do you remember? I defeated death. I've given you the victory. I've taken your sin onto myself. The Bible says he opened their mind to the scriptures. And suddenly all of the pieces started to fit together in this Bible that tells one story, by the way. All of the pieces started to fit together for these guys that he had walked with for a while. And suddenly, this communion that we take every Sunday had great significance for them. In fact, it was something that they did every Sunday following that after the institution of the church. That's why we do it on Sundays. We take it either here or we take it in our small, small groups that meet at another time. We're going to take it in the assembly this morning. You've got some communion elements on your chair there. Uh, there's a little uh, cup of juice. It's got a little piece of unleavened bread and a little bit of juice in there. Uh, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing a song, and we're going to take that together. I want to encourage you as we take that together, remember we serve a God who loves you so much that he made himself a man and came into the world and died on a cross to take your sin onto himself. The reason he did that, the way that he did that, is because he knows you and I will find reasons to doubt his love for us and his commitment to us. So he said, you know what? We're going to put this on display. I want to remove all doubt for these people. I want them to be motivated to put their faith in me. I want them to know that I love them first. And I'm asking them to love me back, but I love them first and I love them more. And that's the message of the cross, guys. Let's pray and remember that this morning as we move into the rest of our lesson. God, uh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the message of the cross. Thank you for the love that motivates you to be on the cross. I pray as we remember the cross this morning, God, we'll remember it is all about your love for us, your love for me. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I see many searching for answers. Speak of 
chapter of Hebrews, if you're looking for some inspiration, Hebrews 11 is a good place to look because it, it recounts a lot of these ordinary people, like I was telling you about a second ago, in the Bible, kind of gives you a summary of a lot of them. And what is common between all of these ordinary people is their faith. They put their faith in God, and so their lives were significant. They made an impact, um, but it was because they chose to put their faith in God. It says in Hebrews 11, verse 32, what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. Notice that phrase, through faith. They through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames and escape the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. The point of this chapter is to highlight the faith of the people in it. It's to highlight their faith. These great people, quote unquote, were not great because they were great. They weren't great because they were great. They were great because they put faith in a great God. And so we have a choice to make because we are encountering the same God today. The question is not, can God strengthen me? The question is not, can God strengthen me? The question is, will I allow him to strengthen me? It's a choice. That's really what it comes down to. We must put our faith in God and not in ourselves. And when we put our faith in God, we get what he gives right? When we just put it in ourselves or when we put it in other people, we only get what, what they give or what we give. We want what he gives. What he gives is way better, right? Way better. Not even close. When I look in the mirror, though, sometimes I see a weak believer, don't you? When you look in the mirror, do you ever think, man, I wish I was better than I am, right? I wish I was better. We've got to put our faith in God, understanding that it is his strength, that it is his power that, that's at work in us to make us better. If we're just looking at ourselves, if we're just looking inward, if we're just navel-gazing, guys, we, we're, our eyes are not in the right place. We've got to look to him. And today we're going to look at a story of a guy named Gideon. We're going to start out looking at it this week. We're going to finish it next week. But Gideon is a guy in the Old Testament who was, by all accounts, a pretty weak man. At least start now. But what we see in the story of Gideon is that over the course of time, as Gideon draws closer to God, as he puts greater faith in God, we see Gideon become a man of great strength, even though, man, he really struggled with doubt. He especially doubted himself, but guys, he doubted God too. He struggled greatly. Three ways I can allow God to strengthen me from the story of Gideon, though, is what we're going to look at. Um, and we're going to hit two of those today. We'll look at the other one, like I said, next week. So just so you know, Gideon is in a terrible situation when we encounter him. He was alive before the Israelite monarchy. Uh, we just finished a series on the minor prophets. We looked at a lot of the kings. This is before even that. This is an old story. So think back to, like, you know, right after 
um, the Israelites entered the promised land in the book of Joshua. Well, Gideon's in the book of Judges right after that, okay? So a long time ago, but now during Gideon's day, uh, the Israelites were being greatly oppressed. Uh, they, had, they had inherited this land that God had promised to them, uh, but because their forefathers decided to worship false gods, uh, which is a running theme, it seems like, in the Old Testament, uh, they were not being blessed at, at this time when Gideon was alive. In fact, there was a, a nation around them known as Midian, the Midianites, uh, who were so numerous, there were, there were too many to count, it says in one point in the Bible. Uh, there were tons and tons of these people. They hated the Israelites. And whenever they saw the Israelites, their raiding parties would come over and they would either steal what they had or they would burn what the Israelites had. And so if you can imagine... You're, you're alive back then, and you know, let's say you're, you're a dad and you've got a wife and kids. There's a lot of dads in here. You know, if we get hungry now in our country, we can run over to the grocery store and pick something up, right? Well, back then, you, you ate what you grew, basically, or ate what you, what you killed, or, or you know, if there was livestock or something like that. Your life was dependent, and the life of your family was dependent on what came up out of that ground. And you've got enemies that are out there that are so mean, if they see that something is growing on your land, guess what they're going to do? They're either going to come and take it, or they're going to come and burn it just so you don't have it. If you have livestock, they're either going to come and take it, or they're going to come and kill it so that you don't have it. And these aren't people that necessarily need it. They've got everything they need. They're just mean, and they don't like you. And, and there's nothing you can do about it because there's so many of them you know, there's just nothing you can do. So what the Israelites were having to do is scatter. They were having to go way up in the mountains or they were having to live in caves and only come out at night and try to hide all their stuff so that these Midianites didn't come and, and take it from them or destroy it. Can you imagine living that way? Can you imagine how hopeless it would feel if you were, you were in that situation where just getting up in the morning and going out and trying to grow some crops, you were taking your life in, in your own hands? Can you imagine living that way? I don't think most of us can. Most of us in this room have never even had to go hungry, much less worry about getting killed for going out and trying to get some food. I mean, I think it's hard for us to identify, but try to put yourself there, okay? That's the situation that Gideon is in. This is a hopeless situation, this, this enemy that is too numerous to count. I want you to look at this, though, as God's personal message to you. Now, you may be facing a hopeless situation today. You may be facing a situation that just feels too big to do anything about. You may be facing an enemy that is too numerous to count, right? It's just too big. It's too great. Here's the thing. The same God that was active in Gideon's life can be active in your life. The same God that was active in Gideon's day can be active in your day. You want to know how Gideon accessed the power of God he accesses the power of God through faith. And the same choice is available to us today. We get to make the choice. And if I'm going to be strengthened by God, number one, I must know that God strengthens, strengthens me as I believe what he says. Number one, God strengthens me as I believe what he says. It says in Judges 6 verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, okay, he's threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress. I'm sure most of you are like, oh, I know exactly what that means, right? Because we thresh wheat and, and we deal with wine presses all the time. Okay, nobody knows what that means. A wine press is a hole. They would dig a hole, and they would throw their grapes down into a hole, and then they would go down there and stomp on it so you could have some nice foot juice later. Who in here likes the foot juice? That's kind of nasty, but that's what they did, right? That's how you made wine. You go stomp the grapes. Uh, that's a hole. Okay, threshing wheat was not done in a hole. Threshing wheat is you, you grab the head of grain, you kind of shake it around like this in your hand, and then you throw it up in the air 
And the idea is you want to go to a windy place, like up on the top of a hill to do that, which most, most places where they would thresh wheat were up on top of a hill because it was windy. Because when you'd throw it up in the air, the heavier grain would fall down, but then the little stuff, like the chaff, would get blown away in the wind. So that's how you'd get your pile of wheat to go you know, eat your oatmeal or whatever. Uh, is you'd go up there and, and throw it up in the air, and then you know, you'd get your, get your wheat and take it off. Um, he's doing it in a hole. Why? Now, by the way, does wind blow around in a hole very well? Not, no, not really. This would have not worked very well. But the reason he's down in a hole threshing his wheat is because he doesn't want his enemies to see him. He's hiding. Okay? So get this picture. Gideon is hiding. This is where we find him uh, at the beginning of the story. He's hiding in a hole from his enemies trying to do a job to get food for his family that's not very easily done in a hole. He's hiding. But it's at this point where he's facing this hopeless situation, he's in this horrible situation, where God comes to him in the form of an angel. Okay, God comes to him and speaks to him, and here's what we need to understand. Things can be different for Gideon if he responds to God's word. Things can be different for this man if he responds to God's word. If you're here this morning and you're facing a hopeless situation, things can be different for you if you respond to God's word. That's the truth. But you have a choice to make. Just like Gideon has a choice to make in this story. And this is God's word to you this morning. You are encountering the same God today that Gideon was encountering back then. You have a choice to make. And just a side note, guys, God speaks through his written word and his messengers. The word angel in the original language means messenger. Here, God sends a messenger to Gideon. Now, a messenger can come in the form of, of uh, an angel, like a supernatural being where they glow and they scare you. Uh, and you hit the ground, and you're like, I'm going to die. And they're like, no, I'm just an angel. It's cool. Get up. Let's talk. Uh, you see that through the book of Judges. That's pretty funny. Every time an angel shows up, like, that's supernatural kind, people are like, I'm going to die. That's the first thing they say, right? They're terrified. Um, an angel, though, doesn't have to be a supernatural being, like with the wings and stuff. It can be another human being. God can send you another person full of the Holy Spirit who loves him, that has a word for you. You know, maybe that friend that really loves God, you know, and they come into your life and, and, they, and they're trying to counsel you through something. It could be that God sent them to you to say what they're saying to you. But here's the thing. It is not from God if whatever they're saying to you contradicts God's written word. And that's the thing. You've got to take those back to God's word. There are people out there, sometimes even well-meaning people, who will come and give you a message that they think is from God. Guys, if it contradicts God's word, that is not a word from the Lord. No matter the sincerity or the well-meaningness of that person, that person may just be deceived. And you need to understand, we need to take everything back to the written word, okay? Take everything back to the word of God. But we need to respond to God's word. Now, there are three areas where it can be really hard to respond to God's word. The first one is when it comes to God's word, I must believe God's affirmation. I believe God's affirmation. Affirmation means encouragement or positive word. Okay, This means I believe what God says about me. And this is a tough one. Okay, But here's what God says about Gideon in verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Where is Gideon? He's in a hole, okay? He doesn't want to fight, right? Two things are hard to believe here. Number one, God is with me. God is with me. Do you know the situation that we're in right now, God? Do you know we're surrounded by the Midianites? That they're too numerous to count? That our people all have to live in caves and hide and can't even grow food? You're with me? Really? God is with me? And then he says, 
God is with you, mighty warrior. What? No, I, I think you got the wrong guy. That's not me. I think you're looking for the other guy. He, he's not here. I'm in a hole. I'm hiding. I don't want to fight. There's nothing about me that's mighty. There's nothing about me that's warrior, right? There's nothing in my family line that's warrior, unless you go way back, right? We're not, that's not us. That's what, here's the thing. God sees the person he created you to be, not necessarily the person that you are. And that's one of the things we talk about a lot here at the crossings, guys, is there is a person that God created you to be. There are things that God created you to do, and God loves you just the way that you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. And what we're going to see him do is he's going to do a work in Gideon's life, even though Gideon is kicking and screaming for him not to, right, sometimes. But you got to believe what God says about you. You guys, you got to believe. God says you are priceless. God says you are loved. God says you are significant. God says he's got plans for you, and he wants to use you to bless other people. That's what God says about you. But man, how often can we struggle to believe that? You know, I know when I was younger, especially, guys, I was so afraid of people knowing who I was, like the real me. I come from a background where I was pretty severely abused. Uh, I struggled with addiction for a long time. I was sexually abused when I was a little kid. I felt like a piece of garbage as I got older. I just felt terrible about myself. I didn't want anybody to know any of that stuff. And, and, and I just didn't believe what God said. I mean, I was familiar somewhat with the Bible. Like I grew up, my parents dragged me to church. I didn't want to go. But I heard all this stuff, and I was like, man, that's a bunch of fairy tales. This God that is up there and loves me and loves the world. And why is the world so messed up if there's a good God that loves everybody? You want a bunch of crap. You know, that's what I thought. I just didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. But how much better would my life have been if I had just started believing him a long time ago? I would have saved myself so much trouble. If I had started believing him a long time ago. But I really, really struggled to believe that. And it's really important that you believe what God says about you and, and what he says about who you can be. Even if you're not there yet. Right? Even if you're not there yet. This is who God says you can be. Who has the credibility? He does. Who has the truth? He does. Who has the authority to make things happen? He does. If he says it, it's true. He says you're priceless and you're loved and he cares about you and he has plans for you and he wants to use you in the world. He looks at us and sees who he made us to be, even if we're not there yet, but he helps us get there. And that's what we're going to see him doing with Gideon. But man, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Another place that it's hard to believe or hard to follow is when it comes to God's word. This is another one. I must believe God's instructions. I must believe God's instructions. God gives instructions to Gideon. It says in verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Man, what a tall order. And you might notice, go in the strength you have. Gideon had the strength when he started to move. When he started to respond to God's word, suddenly he's got the strength, right? That's how it works. Put one foot in front of the other when God is calling you to do something, and he'll supply the strength. In verse 12, the same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that's seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Now, this is where God came to Gideon, and he told Gideon, one of the first things he tells him to do after this encounter is, I want you to go and tear down your father's altar to this false god. And they would do some crazy things to worship these false gods in the ancient world. Uh, ritual mutilations, sacrificial uh, human sacrifice, like they would do ritual orgies, they did all kinds of bad stuff in worship of these gods that was detestable to God. God said, I want you to take that big bull over there, I want you to go tie it, a rope around it, hook it up to that idol, and I want you to knock that thing down. Gideon goes and does what, his, what, what God said to do. He's scared, 
But he goes and does it, and guess what happens as a result of him doing it? He gets in trouble with his family. Don't be surprised if you follow God if there's trouble along the way. Sometimes, whenever God calls us to obey something, it causes trouble. And sometimes it causes trouble even with our own families. When you really start to radically obey God, there will be opposition. Don't think that just because there's opposition, somehow God is not with you in that. Guys, did you know God does not call us to comfort a lot of the time? Whenever he calls us to obedience, it's uncomfortable. And if all I'm going to do is what I want to do, what I'm comfortable with, I will not grow. Because I will not obey. Because anybody who told you that God is only going to call you to the things you're comfortable with, they're, they're selling you something that, that, that God ain't selling. Because there is no story in Scripture, if you read Scripture and read the Bible, the inspired Word of God, if you read the instructions there, if you read about these giants of faith, God, one of the things you will, you will encounter over and over is that God is more concerned with our character than he is with our comfort. Over and over. We see that over and over. And he knows that he's calling Gideon to do something uncomfortable, but he also knows Gideon's character is going to be built up greatly because Gideon is learning to obey even when he doesn't necessarily want to. Guys, who in the world said your want to obey is a prerequisite to your obeying? There are a lot of things God calls me to do that I don't want to do, but I do it anyway because I'm just obeying him right? And you're the same way if you've been walking with the Lord for a while. It's not about our comfort, though. And facing difficulty as a result of obedience doesn't mean God isn't present. In fact, it means just the opposite a lot of the times. Thirdly, when it comes to God's word, I believe God's promises. I must believe God's promises. God promises Gideon, look at this, I am with you and I will be with you. In verse 16, I'm sending you, I will be with you. This promise that he's going to be with him is super important. This promise from God changes everything for Gideon because God's going to call Gideon to go do some scary stuff. But he also says, I'm going to be with you, son. I remember growing up, there was a bully in my neighborhood. And uh, I got off the, the bus one time, and this bully had picked on me. He was several years older than me, a lot stronger than me. Uh, he just beat the tar out of me one day after we got off the bus. I mean, I didn't even make it out hardly 10 yards away. That bus drove away, and this kid just started beating the snot out of me. And he held me down, and dude, he, he was slapping me in the face and kicking me and punching me. And uh, I got home, and I guess my mom could tell I'd been roughed up a little bit. She's like, what happened? And, you know, I told her. And so she said, wait till your dad gets home. I'm like, well, what's he going to do? You know what I mean? Uh, I I didn't know where this was going. Well, my dad got home, and my mom told him what happened, and my dad said, come on, son, we're going to that kid's parents' house. Now, I didn't want to go anywhere near that kid's house. You know how scared I was to go to that kid's house? But I walked down there with my dad, and he walked up to the door and, you know, knocked on the door, and, and he had a little chat with the kid's parents, But do you want to know how terrified I was to go to that kid's house? I was terrified. But guess what? I went. Why? Because I was with my dad. That's why. And sometimes God will call us into very scary situations sometimes when we're facing something that's hopeless. Uh, Maybe God is calling us to do something that's scary. And we're like, I don't want to do that. What? I, I don't want to do I don't want to go that route. But, but we can do it. Why? Because our Father is with us. And that's exactly what God is going to do with Gideon. He's going to call Gideon to do something really scary. We're going to look at that next, next week where he goes and faces the Midianites. But Gideon does it, and the reason he can do it is because his Father is with him. Now, that changes everything. Guys, if you will believe that God is with you as you embark on trying to do these things God is calling you to do, it may still be scary, but you want to know what? You can do it. 
because your Father is with you as long as you're putting your faith in Him. You're not alone. And I need to clarify a couple of terms here uh, on belief and unbelief. And this is super important. You see the words belief and unbelief show up throughout the Bible. Um, First of all, listening plus obeying is what equals belief. Listening plus obeying is what equals belief. I mentioned earlier, faith is belief, it is trust, it is loyalty, and it is obedience. It is those four things. If you take any one of those away, it is no longer biblical faith. The same word is used for belief. Belief and faith are the same exact word, okay? In, in the original languages, same word. We, we render them differently depending on uh, the context, but it's the same word. Uh, that is what mature saving belief is. It, it's, it's obedience. If you take away obedience, though, ignoring plus disobeying, that's unbelief. That's unbelief. That's considered unbelief. And it's important to clarify this because this is confusing sometimes to people that just don't know or that are just learning, but you can believe in God and be an unbeliever. Does that make sense? You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for your sins and still be an unbeliever. And I say that because you can believe all that stuff and not obey God. And it's the disobedient in the scriptures that are referred to as unbelievers. It's the obedient that are referred to as believers. So it's not a question of, do I believe there's a God in heaven? Do I believe Jesus is his son? Do I believe he died on the cross for our sins? It's, do you believe enough to obey him? That's faith. The other is not faith. That's belief, biblical saving belief. The other is considered unbelief. We even see people who believed mentally in God referred to as unbelievers in the Bible. It says in Judges 6, uh, many Israelites had never had victory because they never had this biblical faith, right? We, we said at the beginning, faith equals victory, right? Well, here's what God says to Gideon about some of his ancestors. He said, I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Notice there, underline, you have not listened to me there. Look at... Uh, The way it says in the English Standard Version, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Same phrase in the original language. It's rendered a little bit differently. One says you didn't listen to me. The other says you didn't obey me. Same principle. Okay, You don't listen to God. You don't obey God. This doesn't mean they didn't hear him. This doesn't mean they didn't know. It just means they didn't obey. You don't listen. You don't obey. The Hebrew writer refers back to people like this. In Hebrews 3, it says, Scripture says, if you hear God speak today, don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn like those who rebelled. Who heard God and rebelled? Well, all whom Moses led out of the Egypt rebelled. With whom was God angry for 40 years? He was angry with those who sinned and died in the desert. Who did God swear would never enter his place of rest? He was talking about those who didn't obey him. So we see that they couldn't enter his place place of rest because they didn't believe notice there do you notice there in 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 18 it says he was talking about those who didn't obey him and then right around uh in 19 it says they didn't believe okay you notice that they're unbelievers and i could show you a bunch of examples of this This is just one but god says those who refuse to obey will never enter his place of rest, and he says that they're unbelievers, even though they believed in God. They're unbelievers because they refuse to obey. Obedience is vital. Biblical faith includes obedience. If you're here this morning and you say, man, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've thought I was walking with the Lord for a long time. 
I, because I believed in him. Maybe I went to some church and had a religious experience at some point in my life. I went with my grandma when I was younger. Uh, the, the preacher told me to raise my hand and pray this prayer, and if I pray this prayer, I'm going to be saved. I, I've done all that. Well, the, okay, maybe the prayer's a good prayer, right? Pray, pray and ask God to forgive your sins and come to your own. That's great. We, we encourage praying, right? But it's not faith if it's not accompanied by your continued obedience. And that doesn't mean perfect, guys. We don't mean even, none of us in here would make it if you had to be perfect. But guys, there's a difference between trying to live for God and just not trying at all. There's a difference. And there's, there's some belief systems out there that teach if you have had this religious experience, if you were uh, you know, christened as a baby or whatever it might be, your sins are forgiven. Guys, that's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is you need to put your faith in the Lord and live repentantly for Jesus and make your life about serving him where you give up yourself and you let him take over. And that doesn't mean you do that perfectly. It doesn't mean you don't ever struggle with sin. It doesn't mean you don't fall. But what you do when you fall is you get up and you dust yourself off and you you pray and ask God for forgiveness, but then you don't just keep doing the same thing. Guys, you go and get help. You know, if you need to talk to somebody, if you need to get some church resources to help you or whatever, you involve other people and you get back on the horse where you're obeying God. That's what it takes. Anything less than obeying God and getting up and trying to obey God on a daily basis. Guys, if you're not trying to obey him on a daily basis, guys, I'm not trying to be mean or discourage you, but you are not right with the Lord if that's how you're living. And I say that out of compassion because God doesn't want that for you. And that's part of why we have uh, communities like this where we can get together and talk about these things is because God wants you to plug in and get the help that you need so that you can get on track to being the person that he's calling you to be. And, And nobody can do that by themselves. We weren't created to be able to do that in isolation. Guys, that's why he instituted the church. You know this is his idea, right? And there's a lot more to it than just this. Like, he, he designed us to be in community with one another. He designed us to have relationships with one another. He designed us to, to be close, where we know what's going on in one another's lives, precisely because he knows we're going to struggle and we need help. And a big part of his help comes in the form of the church. We need God's spirit. We need God's word. We need God's people. We need all three of those things here. Secondly, if I'm going to be strengthened, I must know, number two, God strengthens me as I confront my adversaries. God strengthens me as I confront my adversaries. While we are on earth, we're going to face adversaries. And there's going to come a time where all of our enemies are going to be defeated. We're not going to have to worry about any of them. We call that heaven. Between now and then, we're going to face some adversaries. We need to know what those are. The first one is, adversary number one, I must confront myself. I must confront myself. I can be my own worst enemy. I can be my own worst enemy. And for Gideon, if you study Gideon's life, Gideon was often Gideon's worst enemy. If you go read the book of Judges, go read Judges 6, 7, and 8. Go read about Gideon. And and just pay attention to what Gideon says. One of the things you might notice is just about everything Gideon says is an expression of doubt. I mean everything. If you struggle with doubt, here's a guy who struggles with doubt. I mean nearly everything the guy says is an expression of doubt in God or doubt in himself. He says uh, in Judges 6 verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said... The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But, sir, here come the buts, right? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But, sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian? 
But the Lord turned to him and said, I will save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my family. And look at this. He's just airing it out here. It's like, are you sure about this? You abandoned us. You obey, you're not with us. Me? Not me. Can't be me. Man, I know so many people that struggle with doubt. I've met so many people over the years because of my background and the stuff that, uh, you know, I kind of got some information on. I have a lot of people that ask me questions. I have people that, you know, why should I believe the Bible? Hadn't the Bible been rewritten? Like, I, the doubters, they get sent to me a lot. And there are so many people that struggle with doubt, that feel like because they struggle with doubt, they can't have a relationship with God at all. And so they just put the brakes on, and they're like, ah, this obviously isn't for me. I'm going to go do something else. I'm not going to give this any attention anymore. Let me tell you something. The litmus test for a relationship with God is not whether you doubt or not. The litmus test for a relationship with God is whether you obey or not. And one of the things we see in Gideon is a guy who struggles Horribly with doubt, but he believes enough to obey. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. You're like, man, I'm struggling with doubt. I don't know if this God thing's right. I don't know if this Bible can be trusted. I, don't, I just don't know about this. I'm, I'm a doubter, right? My question to you is, do you believe enough to obey? Because if you obey God, even though you doubt, guess what? God counts it. But when you throw up your hand and say, I don't want to do it, I'm done, guess what? God counts that too, but not in a good way. You can be a person of great faith and be a person of great doubt. That's what we see in Gideon. Because even though Gideon is full of doubt, guess what he does? He obeys God. Now, he might have been kicking and screaming on the way. But guess what? He obeys God. He does what God says to do. And God looks at that and says, that's a man of faith. He's in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. You guys realize that? He'd be in the Doubters Hall of Fame, too. But he's a man of great faith. He's referred to as a man of great faith. That is so important for us to understand. It's about obedience. And God's really patient with him too. Because in uh, verse 36 it says, Then Gideon said to God, If you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. Here he's going to ask for the fleece thing, right? He says, I'll put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you're going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. Okay, he's a doubter. An angel appeared to him and spoke to him and said, here's what's going to happen. He's like, ah, I need a little more proof. I'm sorry. This angel, you know, what if it's special effects? Like, I need, I need some more proof. Come on. Uh, He asked for this fleece thing. This is a huge, like, no-no, you know. This is not prescriptive. This is descriptive. Don't get any ideas when you read the story of Gideon. Say, I'm going to try that. God's calling me to do something. I'm going to test him. You know, it says in the Bible, do not test the Lord your God. It says don't do that. This is is not an act of faith here. This is an act of, of unbelief. Gideon's not there yet. God is patient with him, though. And here's the thing. God will not always bless my fleece, but he will always bless my faith. Don't be like Gideon in this situation. Just put your faith in God. Cut out the the, the middleman. (laughs) Circumvent the the doubter's road here. Just, Just get on faith road. That's the way to go. And in the New Testament, there are people who ask Jesus to perform miracles so that they could see it and follow him. In uh, Matthew 12, uh, Jesus said to these people who were saying, hey, do, do a trick so we can believe in you. Jesus said, the people of an evil and unfaithful era look for a miraculous sign. That's what Jesus says. 
And guys, I've been one of those that said, you know what, if, if God will just do this, this, and this, then I'll believe in him. I've, I've been there. I get it. Like, I get the rationale. I struggled with, with unbelief for a long time. I had intellectual issues with believing this stuff. Uh, God was able to lead me to some answers on that, but I get this. Like, it makes logical sense. If God wants me to believe in him, just let me see a miracle, right? You know, there were people that, that Jesus performed miracles in front of, and it said, but they still doubted, or they still didn't believe. You realize that, right? And what God wants us to do is to get our hearts to a point where we will believe what he's already done. And guys, Gideon had witnesses. Before he got to his fleece incident, he had the witnesses of his forefathers. God had led them out of Egypt. God had done crazy, miraculous things. He'd given them victory in battles. He'd, he'd done all kinds of things through Gideon's family and through the Israelites up to that point. In Jesus' day, these people that are asking Jesus to perform a miracle, how much had they seen up to that point <clears throat> that Jesus had done? You realize he wasn't doing his ministry like in a hole, like Gideon threshing wheat. Well, Jesus was out in the open. These people were asking for a sign, but it, it was apparently not with the proper motives, right? Jesus says this is a wicked and unbelieving generation. We need to look at what God has already done and put our faith in him based on what he's already done, or maybe just based on the testimony of the people in this room that you know. If you hang around the crossings, you're going to learn some stories. You're going to learn some stories of redemption. You're going to learn some stories of God doing some crazy work in people's lives. Man, some of these people that are sitting on these pews right now, or these pews, these chairs, uh, if, uh, if you knew where they were a few years ago, you would be amazed at where they are now. It is only an act of God that could clean up some of the lives that are in here. And I don't mean to say they're perfect now. I just mean to say God has a way of working miracles in the lives of people who are hopeless. And that's pretty convincing to me. But there's more. Gideon is in this boat here who uh, he had these testimonies, guys, but he still struggled with doubt. But what he did, where he's a good example, is he chose to obey despite his doubt. And if that's where you are this morning, that's God's word to you, I believe. If you're in a spot where you're doubting and you're like, I'm checking this out, I want to encourage you to dig a little bit deeper. It says, uh, the last passage we'll look at this morning is Isaiah 40, 31. This is what God does for those who trust him. It says that he empowers, God empowers the feeble, and he infuses the powerless with increasing strength. Now, this is talking about somebody who has put their faith in the Lord. He empowers the feeble, and he infuses the powerless with strength. If you're feeling feeble, if you're feeling powerless this morning, guess what? God is here. He is here for you. He will give you strength. He will give you guidance. He will give you everything that you need to face what life is throwing at you today. But it's up to your choice whether you're going to choose to put your faith in him or not. And you can listen to that inner voice that talks down to you, that is self-demeaning and self-depreciating. You can believe those messages from the world that say you're worthless, you don't have anything good going for you, and you never will. You can maybe listen to those, those voices in your life, those toxic people that are always running you down, not building you up. Or you can listen to the voice of the Lord that says you are powerful, that you are poised to make a positive impact, that you can get through this 
And not only can you get through this, you can thrive on the other side of it. You can be a person who helps others. You can be a person who makes the world a better place. You can be a person who I work powerfully through. Guys, that sounds like a much better story. But the difference between this and this is faith. Are you going to put your belief, your trust, your loyalty, and are you going to give God your obedience? Are you going to put your faith in him? Are you going to give your obedience to him? Are you going to keep trying to do life like you've been trying to do life? That's the question today. Now, the reason we exist as a church, we're a church plant here. The reason we exist and the reason we planted this church in Collinsville is because we believe that God wants to do a work in your life. We believe that. We believe that the way God does a work in anybody's life is through his word, his spirit, and also his people. We believe you got to have those three things. I want to invite you, if you're checking out the crossings today, if you're a visitor, if you're new, or if maybe you're just interested in learning more about God, Uh, Go ahead and pull out uh, everybody, members and everybody alike, pull out that cardstock piece of paper that's in your bulletin. It's called a communication card. I want to encourage you to respond today. And I want to just give you a next step uh, if you want to go deeper here. Uh, Our next step here at the crossings, if you want to get connected, if you want to get some questions answered, if you want to talk with somebody uh, about an issue or anything, we want to invite you to fill that card out. Uh, For our members, we want to invite you to fill that card out and and just give yourself a self-assessment today. Do you have any prayer needs? Do you have anything that you need help with? Um, If you're interested in joining the crossings or if you're interested in just getting some questions answered about God, if you just are investigating a relationship, your next step is to study the Bible with us. Mark on your card that you'd like a personal Bible study. Uh, What that is, is it sounds formal, but it's not. It's a couple of friends getting together, opening the scriptures, and saying, what do you think about this? How do we we live this out? It's very simple. Uh, If you're interested in joining the church, we do that with everybody, whether you come from another church or you come from a church background or not, or or if you're just brand new to faith. We study the Bible with every single person that we uh, have join our church. Uh, If you are just investigating and you just want some answers, that's a great place to start as well. Get a Bible study going. Uh, It's pretty simple, non-threatening, and I think you'll learn to enjoy, you know, getting the time with people. We would love to invite you to do that. If you're here this morning and you need some other help with some other stuff, um, if you are dealing with trauma, if you're dealing with grief, if you're dealing with... uh, you know, some kind of issues of abuse, or if you come from a family where you just have uh, a lot of brokenness and you want some help with that, we have resources that are going to help with that as well. Uh, We're actually starting a healing as a choice class uh, on August the 30th. We're going to have orientation for that. Uh, I'm one of the teachers. My wife is uh, teaching the ladies for that. Uh, We get everybody together and we walk through 10 weeks uh, of some material that really just helps deal with some of life's major issues. It's 10 choices that we have to make uh, to put us on a path toward healing. So if you come out of a a situation where you're dealing with brokenness, if you've gone through a divorce, if you're dealing with grief, uh, any of that, uh, guys, we will help you there. We have additional resources uh, for other issues. We've got uh, divorce care. We've got uh, another class that's starting called the Game Plan that's for men who are struggling with pornography addiction. Uh, We have a class called Wounded Heart that is for victims of childhood sexual abuse to get some help there. We'll be offering that uh, later um, in the year or early next year. Um, If any of that is, is something that would be helpful to you, you can indicate that on your card as well, and we'll put you in contact with the people Uh, that can help you. Healing as a Choice is actually starting on August the 30th, like I mentioned a second ago. If that's something you're interested in, uh, indicate it on your card, and we'll put you in touch with the person that can uh, can help you get plugged in there. Seating is limited on that. Uh, So if you're interested, make sure you sign up. Um, But I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to sing a song after my prayer. It's going to give you time to fill that card out. I want to encourage everybody in here to do that. 
after that first song, we'll sing one more, and that'll give you, um, well, that'll, if you need to fill it out further, you can do that. We got some baskets at the back back there where you can drop those off. Uh, so please fill that card out, and uh, please join us next week as we get back together and wrap up the story of Gideon. Uh, one last thing, we two announcements. We've got uh, our block party coming up on Wednesday the 25th. Uh, so if you guys are here, if you haven't heard of it, there's some flyers in your bulletin. Uh, our block party is going to be for families with kids. It's our back-to-school block party. We do it every year. We're going to be setting up out here in the parking lot. We're gonna, we have tons of inflatables uh, that we're going to set up for kids. We're going to have face painting. We're going to have snacks. We're going to have all kinds of stuff going on out there uh, where we expect a pretty big crowd to join us for the block party. If you know any families with children, uh, if you want to come down and hang out, uh, you are welcome to. We're going to be kicking it out there and just meeting people and having fun. Um, we usually have several hundred that come to that thing. Uh, and it's also a, you know, a great opportunity for us to invite people back to church. Because that Sunday, that following Sunday on the 29th, we're going to have our grand opening here at this building. Uh, we've been in this building for a minute, um, not terribly long, but uh, been here for a minute. We didn't get to have a grand opening last year because of COVID. So on the 29th, we're going to have a grand opening here. We're going to have a special service. We'll have some more uh, special things going on that day um, that we'll tell you more about. But we want to invite everybody back here for that. We want to fill this place up. Uh, we're going to be advertising it. It's going to be fun. Um, and we'll have our college kids back there. You might notice our assembly is a little smaller today. Uh, all of our college students are gone. They're at a retreat this weekend. So next week when we get back, we'll see, uh, we'll see our regular crowd back here. We've got 30 or 35 that are gone this morning. Um, but anyway, let me pray for us, and, uh, and then we will wrap up for the day. Lord, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for the story of Gideon. Thank you for giving us a doubter to look at as uh, not someone who was a great example in his doubts, but God, a great example of one who obeyed despite his doubts. I pray we can be obedient and faithful followers of you. God, I believe in my heart you want us to have good lives. You want us to have lives that are filled with joy. Uh, God, I know we're going to have to face hardship, but I also know you want to equip us to be able to deal with it when it comes. Lord, help us to be uh, present for one another. Help us to be people of faith, and it's in your name I pray. Amen.